So last time we started talking about the Limbrough-Feller theorem. We are going to continue our discussion about that. So here the setting is the key is what we wrote last time. We need to write down the sequence as a triangular array. So here you can see that what we are trying to do is that we basically let a sequence grow in this direction. And in every row, we are using it to denote one sample size M. Okay. And then here we just have N random variables in this row. And essentially what we are we can do is that for every row, we can get a summation. So we have Z1, Z2 to Zn. And we are ultimately interested in the asymptotic distribution of the Zn or its uh, average. So it's basically Zn divided by n. That's called Xn bar. So we're essentially interested in the asymptotic distribution of Xn bar. And if you want to connect this to the central limit theorem, you can see that central limit theorem is actually more specific. So basically, in central limit theorem, we require, you see here, the x1 is here, and the second row is x1, x2, and the nth row is x1, x2 to xm. So you're basically requiring every vertical line or every column have the same random variable. But here is the more spec, it's a more general notation. You don't necessarily need to require them to be the same. And another thing where we do the generalization is that in the central limit theorem, so those x1, x2 to xn, they are required to be iid. But in here, it's not required to be iid. Each of them can only, can, can, uh, the only requirements is each of them must be center zero. So having mean zero. But on the other hand, if you look at the if you look at the variance, right, the variance could be different. So that's why in the Limber-Feller theorem here, we are giving each one a specific, let me see, let me do this. We're giving each one a specific variance notation. So for x and i in the nth row, the ith variable in the nth row, we give its variance and notation sigma n i squared. So everything that comes into the Limber condition was related to the sigma n i squared. And for the Limber condition, which looks a little complicated in the beginning, what we're actually saying is that in the denominator, it's the sum, it's the variance of zi, the m, sorry. It's basically the sum of the variances of the variables in the nth row. So it's the summation of n i squared, i go from one to n. That's the notation b n squared stand for. And then the numerator is basically a truncated expect expectation. Still for the, you see, this is bn squared. It's the expectation of x and i squared and take summation over i. Here is similar, but before taking expectation, we actually did a truncation. We only look at the x and i whose absolute values are greater than epsilon times bn. And this must hold for any epsilon. So essentially, we are not interested in the small absolute values of x and i. And we want to make sure that after we do the truncation, so its contribution to b and square is actually going to zero as n go to infinity. So this is a way to actually make sure that my x and i's are not too big. So, or the very, so they, they, they take a small probability, they take large values with small probabilities. And this is a way to actually make sure if you think about a central limit theorem. In the central limit theorem, we basically require each variable's variance, they're equal, right? They're equal as denoted by sigma squared. We require the sigma squared to be finite. That what, that's the only requirement for central limit theorem. Here, of course, you still need that. But in addition, you also need to make some special requirement about the individual behaviors of X and I. So this is essentially to guarantee that your X and I's are pretty well concentrated around zero so that you can have the asymptotic normality. So it's just a safety guarantee. And for, the, for this condition, right? So we say it's sufficient. It's sufficient to give you the normality but it's not necessary. So for it, for it to be necessary, you actually need an additional term here so that, okay, an additional condition here regarding 
the contribution of the variance of the ith variable in the nth row. So you want to make sure that in that nth row, the maximum variance over the total variance is still going down to zero as n go to infinity. So you want to make sure that no term in the nth row has a dominant variance. So with this, with asymptotic normality, then you can go to the Lindbergh condition. But this way is not often used. This one is often used. So often we need the second row just to say, just want to say that the Lindbergh condition is not just sufficient, but also necessary. So when we say that, we need the second row. Okay. And further, we give example about how we can actually use the Lindbergh or how we can actually use the Lindbergh condition. So this is a general example here. Our X and I is just equal to X, I, they are IID minus the mu. So they become centered. And I multiply each one by Z and I as a constant, finite constant. So this is to make sure that I'm creating the general case of random variables that don't have the same variance, but they have mean zero. Because here now the variance depends on z and i square. As long as they are different, the variances can be different, right? And then by that triangular array formulation or presentation, I can define zn and also bn squared. And then here we give you a sufficient condition for asymptotic normality. So basically here we're just saying, in this case, if you have the maximum of z and j square in the nth row over the summation of n i square in the nth row. So still the max over the sum, if this ratio is going to zero as n go to infinity, then you have asymptotic normality regarding your zn. So to show this, to show the statement, we actually use this to show that when this holds, it's sufficient to show the Lindbergh condition holds. So we spend quite some time to show the limber condition hold. And in the proof, right here, the most important thing is this part. We have the i in the indicator function and also in this part, the z and i, they are both i, related to i. But if I want to get this expectation out of the expectation for i, then I need to make this expectation not related to i. And here I have the iid to help me because xi are iid with x1. So I can replace this by x1 by x1, but this one cannot be replaced by x1, right? Z and i is specific to i. So then my strategy is to actually replace this one by the maximum. Once I take the maximum over i, then it's no longer related to i. So then everything in the expectation becomes not related to I and I get it out of, out of the summation. And because in the, in the BN square, here the BN square, if you see here, it has the summation Z and I square. So naturally this one can be canceled with this one. So I'm good. So that's just a simple way of using the, of showing the Lindbergh condition. And we will see that again today. Okay, and as we have seen that the Lindbergh condition is actually very complicated. So here is a simple one to show asymptotic normality. It's called a Lyapunov condition. So here you see there's no epsilon anymore, but we just need to show that this statement holds for one delta and we're good. So this delta can be anything that's positive. And we want to show that the summation of expectation of x and i absolute value to the power two plus delta over bn, which is the summation of e x and i square, right? We already take expectation and we take the summation already. And for that sum to the power of two plus delta. So if the ratio of those two things are going to zero as n go to infinity, we are still good. So you see the difference is when do we take the power two plus delta in the numerator and in the denominator, they are taken not at the same time, right? So basically that's how you can think about the difference here. So the difference here is that in the numerator, we first take the power, then take the sum. So in the summation, there are n items, each raised to the power two plus delta. 
in the, denom in the denominator, we first take the summation and then we take the power. So then you can imagine what, which, when is the case when this will go down to zero? So basically here, this like n terms, multi, uh, n terms added up together and to the power two plus delta, right? So then you can imagine that when you do the expansion, you will definitely have like each term coming out like that. But there's a little tricky here. There's what we also have expectation. But imagine that there's no expectation, then we are in a simpler case, but right? when there's no expectation, maybe I can write it down. So this, is, this becomes like this. So it's actually mm, square root of summation i from one to n. And we have expectation of x and i square. Okay, this thing raised to the power two plus delta. So basically, if you think about delta as equal to two, probably that's easier, right? If you think about delta equal to two, then the square root can be canceled with two. So I'm having the summation of e x i x, x n i squared summation raised to the power two. And here it's raised to the power four. So you see that here, basically the denominator is bigger because we, if we do the expansion, we will have every term in the numerator and we will have some other interaction terms. So basically when you see that here, when the Lyapunov condition holds, it means that these terms, okay, by their self, at every x and i to the power expectation by itself, it's not making a major contribution to this term. That's basically it. And so maybe there's no, you cannot see the direct connection between this and the Lindbergh condition. However, as we did last time, the proof that Lyapunov condition implies Lindbergh condition is quite straightforward. We are basically using the indicator function to help us. So here with the indicator function, we can basically assume, okay, we only need to consider the case where the indicator condition holds. That is the xi absolute value is great, is greater than this. So then we can take this as given and see what it implies, right? And then we just give this an upper bound because we know this is upper bounded by removing the indicator. Since the indicator cannot be greater than one, it's zero or one. So we can upper bound it by one. And that's exactly what we do here. Okay, so last time at the end, we talk about this example, but we didn't finish. So we're going to finish it today. So this is a very useful application about this Limburg failure theorem, which can be considered the generalized central limit theorem. So in this example, we have Bernoulli random variables and they are independent. So the way to use the Limburg failure is to first center each variable as subtracting its mean. So we are creating zero centered variable y n and then we write them in terms of the triangular array, y1, y1, y2, y1, y2, 2, yn. And this is the variance of each ym. So then we can, we can write down the zn as the submission of yi from one to n. bn squared is the variance of zn. It's the summation of pi times one minus pi from i from one to n. So here we're just going to show we can prove the Lyapunov condition. So we can apply the, so Lyapunov was implied the Lindbergh condition. So we can apply the Lindbergh Feller theorem. And as I said, to prove the Lyapunov condition, we only need to pick one delta to show that it holds and we're done. So you see here we pick the simplest one, delta equals one, right? Because it's easier to deal with an, an integer power. Then this numerator is expectation, right? We need to show that this term, yi to the power three. And we just use the definition of ym, yi is xi minus pi. 
So here, I'm just going to use the definition of expectation. Xi takes two values, one with probability pi, zero with probability one minus pi. So when Xi takes one, this cubic becomes one minus pi cubed, and this one becomes negative pi cubed. So then I have this, right? And we stop here, but we can just do one step simplification. You see that a common term I have in both terms is pi times one minus pi. I can subtract that common term, and then I can see that this is equal to pi times one minus pi, okay? And then I'm left with what? I'm left with one minus pi squared from here minus um, pi squared from here. So that's it. And so therefore, you see, this is essentially my variance of yi, right? It's this one. So I can write it as sigma, maybe I can give it a name, okay? Sigma n squared. And similarly, I can write this as sigma i squared times one minus pi squared minus pi squared. Okay, so I basically- Professor, a quick mm -hmm. question. So uh, if, isn't it the expectation of absolute value, in which case should the pi cubed be positive? Okay, good point. Yeah, that's actually, oh, actually, exactly because of, let me see, good point, yeah. Mm. Let me see. Is the absolute value correct? Yes, so it should be positive. Hmm, yes. Let me see if I did the conclusion still holds. So yeah, if when that's the case, yeah, good catch. So we put this here. Then what we will have is, I'll, I'll fix the notes. Yeah, so then we will have this, right? It becomes plus and it becomes plus. Okay, so yes. Okay, yeah, I think the con conclusion still holds, it doesn't matter. So yeah, very nice catch. So given this, okay, so given this, we still can actually set an upper bound on this. So let me, let me, let me continue writing so that we use a new page. So then this condition, I from one to N expectation YI to the power three, BN to the power three. This would become summation I sigma I square one minus P I square plus P I square. Okay, and here, this denominator, we already have it here, okay? So this is bn squared. So I would just, and here this can also be written as summation sigma i squared. I can use this notation. So here I would have, um, yep, i from one to m sigma i squared to the power three over two. I will have that. So then I want to show this thing will go to when under what condition would this thing go to zero as n go to infinity? Okay, so here we just want to give it an upper bound so we can get rid of this term. And the upper bound we're going to use is this. It's actually this one can be shown as smaller or equal than one minus pi plus pi squared. Well, now this is actually a Cauchy inequality, right? So Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and this is equal to one. 
So I can give an upper bound of one. So therefore, you see, I'm left with sigma i squared. Here is basically sigma i squared to this power. So I can cancel out them. So I'm left with this i from one to n. One. So if I want to show, so I want this to go down to zero as n goes to infinity, then it's very obvious that I just need the denominator to go to infinity. If that happens, then I have the Lyapunov condition holds and I'm good. So then the sufficient The sufficient condition is summation sigma i squared i from 1 to n goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. OK, and what does this mean exactly? If we think about it, this left hand side is basically equal to pi 1 minus pi. So, and we know, and also you can see why we don't have the problem of having this hole in the central limit theorem. In central limit theorem, all the PIs are equal to P. So it's a constant and it has nothing to do with I. So therefore you see in that case, the summation of this left-hand side it's just n times p times 1 minus p. So for sure, this will go to infinity, right? But here we do have a concern. If your pi is going down as n go, goes large, so if it goes down too fast, then it's possible that this pro, the summation becomes finite. You can see that. So, so that's why here we need to have a condition to show to say okay this we have, under this condition yes it is sufficient for us to have the Lyapunov condition hold then we have the asymptotic normality but here we don't have this issue because pi is a constant p so that's why in central limit theorem we didn't bother to talk about this condition but here we do so basically we have so in other words okay so in this case, in summary, so the, ran the Bernoulli random variables average has asymptotic normality. Of course, they must be, the average needs to be multiplied by root n, right? And also center, that's also required. But it has no asymptotic normality if we found a sufficient condition. If the variance, basically this one, does not go down to zero too fast. So in other words, we will require this thing to go to infinity as n goes to infinity. So we will need this. If it goes down too fast, this may not achieve. So for example, too fast, an extreme of going down too fast is that after a sequence, after a while, all the random variables have pi equal to zero. Then your Bernoulli draws will stay at zero, right? In that case, no matter how large n is, your average will not be asymptotic normally distributed. So that will give you the intuition about why this is needed because that's an extreme case. Okay. And furthermore, we can actually, basically we can actually make this a little, um, a special, let's look at a special case. Okay, so as an extension of example one, so more general, 
more generally. Another example. We know the summation of IID Bernoulli is binomial. So let's now look at binomial. And here, we're basically going to change our array to be something like this. So what if I have, so previously, right? So here, I'll just write it down. So what if ZM is this one, binomial, it's N, P, N. And if this is the ZN, then how can we have this? How to have ZN minus its mean? Its mean is MPN divided by its standard deviation, MPN1 minus PN. So how would we have this one convert to standard normal? That's our question. So you see, it's kind of similar to what we have here. But over there, the triangular array, you see, so coming back here. So every row, in every row, so this one's probability is P1, P2 to Pn. And these Pi's can be different. However, now I'm actually making them having the same Pn in every row. So if you think about it, it's like, it's like this. So I'm basically, in this special case, we would have, let's say, x1, okay? That is the x11, okay, let's use this. x11, this one follows Bernoulli p1. In the second row, we have x21, x22. And they are IID following Bernoulli P2. And then going down XN1, XN2 to XNM, they are IID following Bernoulli PM. This is the setup we are having here. So that's why within every row, they share the same probability, but the probability can change from row to row. So that's why it's a, it's a different case from the previous one, not exactly the same. And here, the summation, Z1 is just X11. Z2 is X21 plus X22. Here, the general case, Zn is equal to summation X and I, I from one to N. And I'm going to talk about the asymptotic distribution of Zn. So, for this one, we can actually show that to have this, the sufficient condition, if here for us to use the Lindbergh condition, we can actually show that the sufficient condition is still the same as the previous one. But here, because they have the same PM, so the previous condition, this one, can be written as n times pn times one minus pn. So it's actually this. So we want this to go to infinity as n goes to infinity. So it's actually almost the same conclusion, right? The here the difference is that because here the pi's are maybe different, I have to write them as a sum. Here within the nth row, the pi's are equal to pn. So I can write this as this. That's it. So for this one, I'm not going to show how to derive it. You can check the notes. The notes has, has some hint, but I think if you want to fill out the details, I will leave that to you. So why the notes make a reasonable argument, that will be a left, that will be a, a take home question. Okay, so we see another case, right? So here we will have this following asymptotic normality for the partial sum as long as we have this. So it's a similar argument that the probability cannot go down faster than the increase we have here. So basically you can see that it cannot go down faster than um, probably like one over N. It cannot go down faster than that. Otherwise you cannot guarantee it. And example three. Example three is also very important it's very useful for our linear model 
So this is about a simple linear model, least square estimate. So in this simple linear model, I think many of you have seen this before, like from an undergraduate class. This is the beginning of how we teach a linear model. So here we write yi equals intercept plus slope times one variable, one covariate xi, one, one dimensional and one predictor plus error term epsilon i. And here i go from one to two n, right? And here, because we're talking about large sample, this n can grow. So the question we want to make is about the slope estimate. So for the slope estimate, it's actually the least square, or some people call this OLS, ordinary least square estimate. And it's depending on sample size n for sure. So with sample size n, we write the estimate as beta n hat. And we know its formula. So it's actually summation i from 1 to n. xi minus xn bar, the average times yi, divided by xi minus xn bar squared. That's the least square estimate. And clearly, we see that here it is some weighted sum of y, right? So I can basically write it as this. I can basically write it as summation of some weight. And a weight looks like this. It's actually xi minus xm bar. That's the numerator. In the denominator, it's actually, I'm going to call it j from one to m, xi minus xm bar squared. That's the weight times yi. So it's a weighted sum of the yi. And here we know the yi, that's a typical assumption in linear model. We assume everything is fixed except epsilon i. Epsilon i is the only random variable that makes y i random. So therefore, if epsilon i's are i i d, you can, the common assumption is that i i d normal, right, normally distributed. And, but here we just need i i d. So basically we have, if epsilon i's are i i d, then we will have y i independent, right? Independence still carries over but we no longer have yi's identically distributed. The reason is that each yi has its mean as this alpha plus beta xi. The mean is different for yi's. But if we do the centering, then we can still have yi's in the iid. So basically, if we do the centering on yi, we can get back to epsilon i's, they are iid. However, the center will not help with the weight, right? So in the OLS estimate, this weight is clearly depending on I through the numerator. So therefore, how can we prove the asymptotic normality of the least square estimate? That's the question we're going to address here. And we need Lindbergh feller. So now you see, we, link, we learned that not just for, uh, just for the theorem itself, it's actually very useful in statistics. Now we see it's very, very powerful use application in least square estimate. I know many of you know the result that this, the BM of beta N is asymptotically normal. When this is asymptotically normal, but you actually don't know the condition for that, right? The condition is often taken as granted. So here we're going to show a sufficient condition for the asymptotic normality. And again, we are going to use the lindbergh feller theorem. So here we just give you the answer and give this, put this question as a proof as opposed to a question. So we want to give you the answer is that a sufficient condition is basically some, some form we have seen already. It's basically this, the maximum of the weight Okay, so let's say here I have i from one to m. 
the maximum of the weight, or probably let me use the, yeah, I'll stick with that. So the maximum of the weight, xi minus xm bar over the summation, that's part of the weight actually, xi minus xm bar square. So this is, um, if you look at this as a whole thing, it's basically a maximum over the weight, j. I want to say that if this one goes to zero as n go to infinity, then it's sufficient to guarantee the Lindbergh condition and the asymptotic normality. So in other words, you see here, it's like for a weight of each yi, we don't want any single weight to dominate. And in fact, as my n goes to infinity, the maximum of the weight should actually go down to zero. If the maximum will go down to zero. If we, we so basically we cannot let a max, let any weight to be constant, unrelated to, irrelated to i, irrelated to n, sorry. Yeah, so you need to have basically, if you have n very, very large, right? In the summation, you have many, many terms and each term's weight I take the maximum across the terms. I want the maximum could go down to zero as n go to infinity. And if we recall, this is very like, this is actually, oh, sorry, I bet my bad. Sorry, I missed this. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I think that's, 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 a, that's a mistake. Yeah, I need actually this squared. So actually you see this actually, is echoing what we have seen before, this result. In this result, we actually show that for this general case, we also need this Z and I. It's kind of like the weight we've seen over there. The maximum of Z and J square, J from one to M, over the summation of Z and I square, I from one to M. So basically both I and J are going from one to M but I don't want to confuse the index. So in the numerator, I use J. In the denominator, I use I. But the ratio must go to down to zero as n go to infinity. So it's similar. It's similar here. Okay, so I also need this. And so basically I will leave the proof for you to check yourself. The idea is totally the same as that one. So we still need to get this one. So let me put it back. We still need to work with this term. Try to make this term change it to max. So it's not related to i anymore. Then I use the iid to change this x1, x1, get this out of the summation for i, and I get cancellation. So the proof is basically a specification, special case of this one. So I'm not going to do it again, but I'll leave this to you. And so coming back here, the result is very important. So then how can we use the Lindbergh Feder theorem to actually derive the asymptotic distribution for this beta hat n? Here it is. So basically, we would actually be able to show this. Okay, so we will actually work with the epsilon i. So work with epsilon i's so that so then we can apply that example's result right because epsilon i's are iid because epsilon i's are iid because of this reason we will work with them so therefore we can show that by checking the Lindbergh condition and apply the Lindbergh-Federer theorem. So I just show, write it in short as LF. So if, by doing so, we can actually prove that the asymptotic normality would look like summation i from one to m xi minus xm bar times epsilon i over sigma times summation xi minus xn bar square. Okay, i from one to n as well. So this thing will convert in law to standard normal. 
This is actually the application of that example. We can actually get this form. So basically what you want to show is, let me if I pull this back, okay? If I pull this back, what you want to show this is basically Zn, what is Zn, what is Bn, right? And finally you have Zn over Bn going to standard normal. That's the general result. And applying this to this coefficient linear model special case, this is what we'll get by algebra based on the Zn and Bn. Okay, and then how can we relate this to beta n hat minus beta n? So actually we can show that you are going to use the fact of this, right? You're going to use the fact that because this beta n hat by definition is actually, you know, we can write this i from one to m, x i minus x m bar times, it's actually y i, times y i, this is the definition here, but y i itself is equal to, what? It's equal to alpha plus beta x i plus epsilon i, okay? And here, denominator, i from one to m, x i minus x m bar square. So actually by some algebra, we can show that here, this formula, we can rewrite it as just beta, okay, plus denominator space summation x i minus x m bar times epsilon i. So we can actually just write it as this. So therefore, you see, having the asymptotic normality for this term immediately implied asymptotic normality for this term. So the end result would actually become, that is, I would have, so the beta is this and this, right? So given the asymptotic normality here, what I would actually be able to show is the asymptotic normality for beta n hat. So essentially it's equal to this. It's equal to the root n i from one to n x i minus x bar square. So times beta n hat minus beta, this will converge in law. I can multiply sigma into the right hand side because it's not related to m to normal distribution, zero mean sigma square. So this two goes to the side and this stays because here I have the square. So basically I multiply that so, to, so I, that I can get the denominator as the square root instead of just the summation of squares. So I'm doing this. And so then that's it. So basically this is the asymptotic distribution for beta n hat. And how can we see the stabilizing effect? It's actually here. So this term itself is actually going to infinity as n goes up. Okay, so that's why it's actually, this is a growing term. It's counteracting the shrinking term here because we know by, we can also use the law of large numbers to help us get the consistency. That is beta n hat is convergent to beta in probability. We can show that. So that's why this term is going down to zero. Without this term, if we just write the convergence in law for this term only, it will be zero. But with this term as a stabilizer, we can stabilizing this product at Gaussian distribution with variance sigma square. And the variance of sigma square, sorry, I think I didn't give the notation here. The variance of sigma, the, the sigma square is actually the variance of epsilon. So I should write it. So the variance of epsilon 
um, maybe over here, the variance of epsilon i is sigma square. So we, we use this notation so that we get here. Okay, so I'll leave the details for you to check, but basically this is a very important result as an application of the Limberfeller theorem. So that's why we can have the asymptotic normality for least square estimate. And here for simplicity, we're just talking about we're just talking about the beta as a was one parameter, and this is one estimator. We didn't look at alpha and beta jointly. But you know, actually we can do that. So if we use the multivariate version, then we can actually show the alpha and beta as a vector and their estimates alpha hat, beta alpha n hat, beta n hat, they will be jointly normally distributed. So they can converge asymptotically to a two dimensional normal distribution. But here for simplicity, we just talk about the slope only. We didn't talk about the, them jointly. Okay, so I hope this makes sense to you. And also for those of you who have, who are familiar with the other class I taught, I think some of you have taken the other class I taught before. It's actually the, what we call the, um, so the 205, right? Hierarchical linear model. So recall in that class, in the multivariate linear model, so if we use the vector form, right? If we write y equals x beta plus epsilon. So when we write it this way, we actually are having, this is an n by one vector. This is an n by p vector, p by one vector, n by one vector. And in this way we write it, the first column of x is all ones. So this is called a design matrix. So x will look like this. So this is one here, and then x1 to xp minus one. So p minus one predictors, one is the, co is the intercept. So if we write it this way, if you recall, and if we define our beta hat, this is now a p by one vector as x, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So if we define that, then this is the OLS estimate Okay, and then it's asymptotic distribution actually is having this form. So it's basically, so the asymptotic variance or, or probably not asymptotic variance. Let me just say the variance. The variance of beta hat is actually taking this form, x transpose x inverse sigma, sigma square, yep. And here the sigma square is still the variance of each error term. So epsilon follows, um, I would say variance of epsilon is equal to sigma square times identity matrix P. So if that's the case, then the variance of this estimator will be equal to that. And then you can see it's actually the case. So if I think about dividing so this is the multiplicate, multiplier to this, right? And so in this one dimensional case, you can actually see that it's basically applied to here. It's basically variance of beta n hat is equal to sigma squared divided by xi minus xm bar squared i from one to n. So you see, this is a special case of this because here it is a covariance matrix, so P by P. And here I'm just picking one entry out of it. So things are connected. So, but here I'm not talking about the asymptotic distribution anymore. I'm just saying that in the multivariate version, we have a simpler, simpler presentation of the whole thing. Here, we only look at one particular variable's slope. So that's why we have the scalar form, but this is the vector form. That's just a recall of what we have said in the other class. But for those of you who haven't taken that class before, that's totally fine, yeah. So it's a side note as a refresh of mind. Okay, so we're done. We basically concluded the Limberfeller part regarding the independent, but not identically, depend identically distributed case. Now we're going to move 
on to talk about the asymptotic normality of another way. That is, we keep the identical distribution, but we drop the independence. So what will happen like that? And this Anna, is- May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so for the XI, are there random variables or just constants? They are constants in the linear model setup. Let me put it back. So in the linear model, almost every linear model class starts with having the covariates as fixed. They only consider this error term to be random. And you can see why this will make sense because what you're ultimately interested is the relationship. You want to estimate the relationship between Y and X and you consider the, the, the data points that are not exactly on the line, you consider the vertical distance to be random, but you think the relationship is what you're interested in. So in other words, you don't really care about whether your XIs are accurately measured or not. You consider them just as some random, or I was not random, not use the term, word, term random. They are just some measurements you collect and you want to see given those XI, how can I infer the relationship between Y and XI? And this also has a name in, in Fisher's language. They he calls it conditional inference. So you can see that we are basically conditioning on the XIs to talk about the parameter estimation. And that can simplify things a lot. If you don't do that, if you consider XIs to be random as well, then you need some additional assumption. You need to assume that how XIs are independent of the error term. You need that. Otherwise, the argument cannot go through. But in statistics, there are some people are indeed working for the random XI case. They call it random design. But as I said, most um, starting point, like the, the linear model class, we talk about fixed design because that's, that's actually, I think it's, it's relevant enough to our applications in most applications. Yeah, and I know like if you think about the random predictors, also there are some models called the measurement error models, which are also designed to deal with those cases. Okay, so yeah, that's a very good question. So and at all the discussion here, XIs are constants. So that's why I'm writing it as lowercase instead of uppercase. And here the uppercase is just for the, the matrix notation. Okay, so Moving on, we're now going to talk about a case where we have no independence, but identically distributed. Right, we talk about the other side. So the previous Lindbergh is for dropping the identical distribution but keeping the independence. Now we drop the independence but keeping the identical distributed. So I want you to make you aware of that in statistical methods, once we drop the independence assumption, it becomes very difficult, right? Independence is a very nice thing to work with. You can see it clearly in the, in, when we write down the likelihood, when things are independent, you can just write the likelihood as a product of the individual data points contribution to the likelihood. You can do the factorization. But if they're not independent, you have a problem. However, a lot of real data are not independent. For example, time series data, that's clearly not independent because the measurement at the current time point would depend on the measurement at the previous time point. So they will influence each other's values. So that's a violation of independence. So here we want to drop the independence but we replace it by another assumption, which is actually still strong, but it may mimic real data better. Okay, so now let's introduce two assumptions for non-independent sequence. So X1, X2, Xn, and so on. Still our random variable sequence. So here I have one question for you. So what would you think as reasonable in terms of the dependence in a sequence? So we would think, okay, we hope that the dependence will decay as the distance goes away, right? So we think probably it's reasonable to assume X1, X2 has stronger dependence than X1 and Xn has. 
So that's actually a very useful assumption, and we will actually incorporate that. And second, we hope that the dependence is only depending on the relative distance, but not the absolute position. So what I mean by that is that I hope the dependence between x1 and x2 is the same as the dependence between x2 and x3. It's the same as dependence between xn and xn plus one. Okay, those two things are our assumptions. The first one is a definition we call stationary sequence. So that's what I just said. So stationary sequence is saying that the joint distribution, the joint distribution of xi to xi plus k. So it's a length k subsequence for any k greater than zero so stays the same for all i's. So i from one, two, and so on. And this holds, this statement holds for any k. So I should add it here. For any k, that is one or two, and so on. So for any k, that is the length, then the subsequence always have the same joint distribution regardless of i. So that's what I said. It doesn't depend on where the subsequence is located, but you have the same joint distribution. Okay, a very direct result of the stationary assumption is that, so as a result, so this, this assumption gave me this nice result, that is, the covariance of xi and xj only depends on the absolute difference of j and i. So their position don't, don't, ma don't matter. Their positions don't matter. It's just their distance in the sequence that matters. And what is a very good result for this? That is, I can actually easily calculate the, code, the, the, the variance of a summation. So think about it. So then as a result, you see, if I'm interested in the variance of summation xi, i from one to n, what would I have? The general variance of a sum can be written as Actually, it's actually summation i from 1 to n, summation j from 1 to n, covariance xi, xj, right? This is just an expansion, and this is the general definition of the sum of a variance. So think about it, right? This is something we actually use as the, this is just a fact about the definition of variance based on the definition of expectation. So that carries away from there. But in practice, because we often assume IID, IID means that for any I doesn't equal to J, covariance is zero. So we drop a lot of terms and we only keep the covariance between XI and XI itself. That's why we can simplify this as a summation of variance XI. But that's just a result of independence it's not a general result. This is a general result. And then furthermore, how I can rewrite the summation by putting xi xi to one term and putting i doesn't equal to j another term. So this can be written as summation i from one to n variance xi plus summation i doesn't equal to j covariance xi xj. So this is a double sum, okay? i doesn't equal to j. So that's why I said in, in the independence case, this term is zero, I'm left with this term, but now we are more general. And here we know some of the terms are not zero. So furthermore, because covariance is symmetric between x and xj, I can write the second term as 
I can write a second term as two times i less than j. So I change not equal to one direction, covariance xi, xj. Okay, then I'm going to use the stationary sequence. You see, in the sum, I have many, many pairs, but I can group certain pairs together if their i minus j absolute value is the same. So how many groups do I have? You can think about it. So when i doesn't equal to j, this difference can be as small as one, right? They differ by one and as big as n minus one. When xi is x1, xj is xn, their difference is n minus one. And how many pairs do I have for each difference? When i and j differ by one, I could have x1, x2, x2, x3, x3, x4, up to xn, xn minus one, x min n minus one, xn. So for i minus j equal to one, or j minus i equal to one, I would have n minus one such pairs. But for j minus one equal to n minus one, I only have one pair, that's x1, xn. So in other words, the difference and the number of pairs add up to n. So when the difference is one, I have n minus one pairs. When the difference is n minus one, I have one pair. So I can rewrite this second term here, that's the key. I can rewrite the second term, this one, by taking the summation over the gap. I let the gap k go from one to n minus one. And for each gap, I have n minus k pairs, okay? And so for each pair by stationarity, they have the same covariance. Then I can just write the covariance as x1, xk, 1 plus k. That's it. So you see, I simplify this by stationarity. And that's the key. And that will help me a lot. So therefore, you see, if I can define notations accordingly, so a new paper. So if I can define, denote, basically, give it a notation. If I denote xi, right here, they are identically distributed. So I just denote this to be sigma squared. And I give the covariance for gap k variable pairs, x1, x1 plus k. A notation, I call it gamma k. So I only need this, right? And this k can go from one to n minus one. As long as I define those two notations, then the variance of the summation i from one to n becomes n times sigma squared, n copies plus two times here, k from one to n minus one. And I just write it, k from one to n minus one times n minus k times gamma k. That will be the formula for the summation. And again, we want to generalize our central limit theorem. So we are interested in the average. Then the average, we write x n bar. How would this one behave? Its variance, we actually know, is equal to the variance of the sum divided by n, right? Actually divided by n squared, my bad. So it's actually divided by in, inside, of several, inside of variance, get it out, it's divided by n squared. It's this one. Okay, we just do the division by n. Uh, yeah, we just did division by n squared. Then we are left with sigma squared over n 
2 over n plus 2 over n k n minus k gamma k. That's it. And we can clearly see that the first term will go down to 0 as n go to infinity. For this term, it depends on how the gamma k is like. But if the gamma k is not related to n, well, then we would require this term to actually converge to, oh, sorry, I think I missed it, it's n squared, my bad. Yeah, we have n squared here. So I'll, I'll talk about this later. But, you know, for the central limit theorem, what we're ultimately interested in is this term, right? So root n times xn bar minus mu. We're interested in this term. So in order to have an asymptotic distribution that stabilizes, the variance of this term should be finite. It should not change with n. So we just do that simple thing. You see, subtracting mu will not change in the variance, right? Any linear subtraction of a constant will not alter the variance. And then we're just multiplying this by root n. And then we multiply by root n, getting all the variance becomes multiplied by n. So multiplying n, n here, I'm left with So you see that this is a general case of central limit theorem. In the central limit theorem, all the gamma k's are zero. So that's why we don't need to worry about the set first, second term. We're left with the first term. And that's the asymptotic variance. So in CLT, so all the gamma k's are zero. So we don't need to worry about it. But here we have the dependence, right? So then in order to have this asymptotic variance equal to a constant, we would need this term to actually converge to a constant. So more generally, if we have this 2 over n summation k from 1 to n minus 1, n minus k gamma k, if we can have this converge to some constant gamma as n goes to infinity, then we would have the variance xn bar minus mu. This converge to sigma squared plus gamma as n goes to infinity. That would be nice. Okay, and then the what's left is the normality part, right? We have the asymptotic variance conversion to this, but how about normality? Will this behave, will this be normally distributed? That's another question. Okay, so now we have, we have left with one question, two questions. So the first question is how? How to find what kind of sequence can achieve this? That's the first question. And the second question is, does, does this root n x n minus mu converge in law to normal distribution with mean zero variance sigma squared plus gamma? That's the second question. And so we will address both questions later. So for now, we'll give you a special case where the first condition holds. That is, we do have this term converge to gamma as n go to infinity. So we're going to introduce a special type of sequence, which we call m-dependent sequence. So for m-dependent sequence, it's a special case of dependent sequence. Basically, we say that two variables are no longer dependent if their distance is greater than m. So by definition is that given m, so it's greater or equal to zero, non-negative integer. 
it's an integer. And we say that the, the sequence is M dependent. And we say X1, X2, and so on is M dependent. If X1 to XI and XJ to XJ plus one and so on are independent when J minus I is greater than M. So we just give this general notation about the independence of two vectors or two sequences. But you can consider this as this implies pairwise independence as well. So what this implies is that given this assumption, we would have covariance x1, x1 plus k equal to zero if k is greater than m. This is what is implying. Okay, and then you see it's very important for our conclusion here, right? So revisiting this conclusion. So let's look at this. So then this, the left-hand side, two over m, summation k from one to m minus one, m minus k, gamma k. We are basically just reducing the sum to go from one to m because anything greater than m, when the gap is greater than m, gamma k is equal to zero. So that is gamma k is equal to zero if k is greater than m. So this is reduced to two over m, k from one to m, n minus k, gamma k. That's it. And then you see that this is super nice because I can get this into the, I can get n into this. So I'm having two times k go from one to m in minus k over m times gamma k. And then the limit becomes very obvious. This is the only term related to m. If I let n go to infinity, this term, because k is bounded from n, right? One to m, so it's a constant, not related to n. So this is going to one. So I'm left with two times k from one to m, gamma k. That's it. So that's why as long as I can assure, ensure every gamma k is bounded, this is bounded. And I can just denote this as my gamma. I'm done. Okay, so I can just denote this as my gamma. So that's why in the following discussion, we are just going to talk about the central limit theorem's generalization in terms of stationary and M-dependent sequence. So for those kind of variables, we can still ensure, okay, we have asymptotic normality for the average. But even though the M-dependent sequence seems to be arbitrary, but you see that as long as you can have a large enough fixed M, so if you can safely assume, okay, my data, say after a year, my data are no longer dependent, you can assume them something like that. You can find a large enough M, then you can apply this assumption and still assume asymptotic normality. Okay, so that's all for today. We'll stop here. And let me see.